Hello, Slush. Amazing to see you all here. What an incredible two days it's been. I want to thank each and every one of you for making Slush as magical as ever. But don't worry, it's not over yet. Welcome to the Slush 100 final. My name is Kalle Kahampa, and I'm the head of startups at Slush. Slush 100 is our longest running concept, and this year we set out to expand it even further. It has evolved beyond its pitch competition roots into a full follow-along program that delivers concrete advice and access to top-near networks for early stage founders. A huge shout out goes to our funds, Cherry Ventures and General Catalyst. Thank you for making this a reality. To ensure only the best of the best qualify for Slush 100, this year we set the requirements to attract high potential early stage startups. The applicant startups had to be founded in 21 or earlier, based in Europe or North America, and with up to 2 million euros raised in equity funding to, to keep the competition focused on early stage companies. Here's a quick look at the journey so far. We started with over 1,000 applicants, selected the top 100 based on their applications, the top 50 from pitch decks, and the top 20 uh, through pitch videos. The selection process was led by our partners, Cherry and GC. To support these founders, we've hosted online sessions featuring some of the best names in the industry, including top VCs and solo GPs. Just two days ago, we had an incredible Q&A with a longtime Slush, Slush supporter, Cal Henderson, here in Helsinki. Shout out to Cal. Yesterday, the top 20 took the startup stage and pitched their hearts out. Today, we are down to three finalists, each vying for a 1 million euro equity investment. Earlier today, um, they met with the investors, and in just a minute, you'll get to meet them, and of course, hear their final pitches. Their fate will be decided by our amazing judges. Let's welcome our exceptional jury on stage. First up, we have Juliet Balin, partner at General Catalyst, and Philip Dames, founding partner at Cherry Ventures. The fund judges are supported by two superstar founders you've already got to witness on our stages. Please welcome Cal Henderson, co-founder and former CTO of Slack, and Jochen Engert, co-founder and CEO of Flix. Thank you all for bringing your expertise to this stage. We are honored to have such an incredible group with us to help decide this year's winner. Next up, let's go through some practicalities. Each finalist will pitch for five minutes, followed by a five-minute Q&A. And my dear Slush audience, I want to make a deal with you. I need you to play an important role. These founders are up for a one million euro investment. Let's show them our support throughout this final round. Slush, it is time to bring out our first finalist. First up, we will wel welcome Cormac Kisholm from DevAlley. DevAlley provides an AI-driven accessibility platform. They focus on helping businesses and websites become more accessible to people with disabilities by automatically identifying and resolving accessibility issues. DevAlley's platform uses AI to detect issues related to web content, ensuring compliance with accessibility standards, and improving the user experience for individuals with diverse needs. Please welcome Cormac on stage.
Hello everyone, my name is Cormac and I'm the CEO of DevAlly. We make digital products usable by people with disabilities. Today, 97% of the web is inaccessible for people with disabilities. Let me show you a quick example. So this sentence contains a link, but if I asked you to click the link, would you know where to click? No. How about now? This is a very simple fix for a poorly designed digital experience, one designed without accessibility in mind for someone with color blindness. But color blindness is just one of many different types of disability that 1.3 billion people face globally. In seven months, the European Accessibility Act will mandate that your digital products and services must be accessibility compliant in order to do business in Europe. What GDPR did for data protection, this act will do for accessibility. But here's the thing. Building accessible products is brutal. For one, it's incredibly expensive, and audits can cost anything from 25 to 100 grand per audit. Two, it's inefficient. 80% of accessibility testing still requires some form of manual review. And three, it's difficult. Retrofitting accessibility into an existing product can increase the overall development time by 40%. I know this pain firsthand because it took me and my team of five dedicated engineers three months to retrofit just one product for accessibility. It's kind of like trying to add chocolate chips into cookies after you've already baked them. But with DevAlly, we make building accessible products easy. Our automated reporting tools detect accessibility issues in your products in real time right where you build. Then we leverage AI to fix these issues in your code with clear guidance and actionable steps. And finally, we integrate seamlessly into the leading project management and development tools to help streamline your workflow so you can go from issue detection to remediation and deployment all at the click of a button. The digital accessibility software market is set to explode. It's projected to hit 1 billion by the end of 2029, but that's just on traditional testing tools. Businesses are expected to spend a staggering 22 billion in order to achieve compliance with the European Accessibility Act. We kicked off this whole process by conducting research with accessibility experts in over 60 different enterprises. From there, we created a prioritized backlog of features, and we built an amazing board of advisors of accessibility experts. And we've recently secured two paid design partnerships with Enterprise. But we're not stopping there. We're at Slush. We want to support startups. So starting today, you can sign up for our accessibility center at devally.com. Behind it all is a team purposely assembled for success. If you can't tell already, I love accessibility. For the last seven years, I've led accessibility compliant product development for companies like United Health Group and JP Morgan Chase. Darren, our CTO, has over 10 years' experience implementing architecture for companies like Shutterstock and SAP. And Patrick, our COO, has led sales and go-to-market functions for companies like LinkedIn, SmartLink, and Zendesk. We're looking to raise our pre-seed round at the start of next year to help cement our position as the go-to solution for digital accessibility. But accessibility isn't just about compliance. It's about people. These are real people with real problems. We all have a responsibility to fix this. So when you're ready to build products that work for everyone, we are your ally. Thank you. Thank you, Cormac. We could go here. We can be here in the middle. All right, thanks for an excellent pitch. And uh, let's begin with the Q&A. Julie, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, thank you so much for doing this, Cormac. It's so nice to meet you and to learn more about your team. Um, can you tell us a bit more about how you and your founders are each individually contributing to what you are building? And obviously, you have unique backgrounds. But when you think about the next 12 months, how are each of you going to focus your time? Mm -hmm. 
So again, my background is in engineering. I led design systems engineering for United Health Group and Optum. Uh, my background is ensuring that reusable components are accessible at scale. Um, Patrick, again, has tons of experience in selling across internationally and EMEA. And Darren, as a CTO, has tons of experience in terms of structuring data for training LLMs as well. So we're looking to build out a product that will make accessibility easy and affordable for everyone. Awesome, thank you. Great pitch, thank you. Um, looking at Death Alley across um, the next couple of years, what's your vision for the company? Where do you see Death Alley in five years? We want to be the global standard for accessibility and we want accessibility to be easily adoptable into all products and all forms of digital products moving forward as we build. We want to expand beyond accessibility into making sure that compliance is easily and affordable for developers and easy to integrate as part of the development pipeline. As, uh, as somebody who is colorblind, I really appreciate what you're doing. Um, <laughs> how, how, are you thinking of, uh, how do you set yourself apart from existing tools that, uh, that do you know, accessibility scanning and, and raising the kind of issues that, that you showed in your demo. Is it, is it the focus on the kind of automatic remediation piece or do you go beyond where, where existing tools have been? So we want to in incorporate obviously the remediation piece, but we're starting to expand into things like cognitive complexity and understanding learning disabilities and going beyond just the traditional kind of categorized disabilities of vision impairment, hearing impairment, motor impairment. We want to build products that are adoptable for everyone. And the benefit of that is it's for everyone. It's not about being categorized as a disability. We all traditionally use accessibility tools every single day, light and dark mode, captions. These are things that were invented as accessibility features that we all use and champion every day. So it's about making better user experiences as a whole. I really want to understand why are you building this? Like, what's your motivation? What's going to also push you in 10 years from now to continue to build this? Why are you doing this? One conversation with one of our advisors or the people that we've met will answer that question for you. There are so many people out there that are being excluded from the fundamental rights of technology that we all take for granted. When COVID happened, we all got told to stay at home and use online technology. Other people didn't have that option. So it's about making a world that we can actually all be proud of. And as a European, as you know, people always kind of give it about regulation and how Europe likes to regulate, we should be so proud of what we're doing for our citizens. All right. Cool. All right. Is that it? Well, thanks a lot, Cormac. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Really good. Thanks a lot. Thank you, folks. Next up, let's welcome our second finalist, Dora Jamber from Mohana. Mohana is fixing the $17 billion women's midlife health crisis by helping women save $3,000 on medical guesswork and find relief in months with their sub subscription-based physician care plans, all tailored to their users' unique biology. Please welcome on stage, Dora. I am the CEO and co-founder of Mohana. Right now, millions of women are spending thousands of dollars on a problem that their doctors cannot fix, perimenopause. Perimenopause is a hormonal transition that leads up to menopause that can last up to 15 years and that impacts every single woman. This is your girlfriends, your wives, your sisters, your daughters, your mothers, your neighbor, and your top executives. 90% of women have disruptive symptoms. 75% of them are actively looking for solutions without success. 
And as a result, one in three even consider leaving their careers. Esther was one of them. She spent $3,000 before she found Mohana. And this is what her journey looked like. Fragmented, inefficient, and expensive. And this is the reality for the one billion women who are currently navigating perimenopause. Perimenopause is not just a woman's problem. It actually impacts careers, families, and marriages. To understand what is going on, we went out to speak with hundreds of women and their physicians, and we learned three key problems. First, the average physician actually doesn't get a whole lot of training on perimenopause. And as a result of that, something as simple as prescribing the relevant blood test is not getting done. Second, specialist clinics offer a great option. They overcome this knowledge gap but they rely on human resources, and we know that this is extremely difficult to scale up. And third, we learned that even though you might get access to medication and that might provide some relief, the biggest symptom relief comes from critical lifestyle changes that can support this transition. And we know that as humans, we are notoriously bad at changing our lifestyle. And this is where Mohana comes in. We're combining the three key ingredients for real symptom relief. Precision, personalized care, and behavioral psychology. So as the first step, our users come in and complete a blood test to understand what is going on in my body. We leverage the result of this blood test together with the user's symptoms to give them a care plan that consists of the most impactful recommendations for their symptoms. And third, they use the Mohana app to make sure they succeed in actually implementing this care plan, using the same behavioral psychology that made Noom a $4 billion company. This sounds great, but how do we bring this to 50% of the population? Well, this is where my background as an AI scientist comes in. We are building the first AI system that's able to digest patients' biometrics, smart device, smart device data, blood test results, symptoms, medical history, synthesize the latest medical research, and produce a care plan that actually works for that individual. This is the first time we have a technology that's able to provide this level of personalization in healthcare that actually scales. And this goes well beyond perimenopause. We've built the exact team needed to make this a reality. I have spent the last decade working as an AI scientist, building generative AI and products for millions of users at companies like Shopify and ServiceNow. My co-founder is a serial entrepreneur who built $160 million in e-commerce revenues for giants like Emma and Bain. We also have Athena, our founding engineer, a professor of behavioral psychology, and two leading experts in hormonal health and nutrition. Today, we are starting with B2C subscriptions for our application and test kits. Next up, we are partnering with employers, insurance, and clinics. And our big vision is to make sure that we can integrate Mohana into the physician's office. Today, we built Mohana entirely from our founding team's own investment. And without having officially launched, we have proven that our product works because we've been working with users from day one. Women are finding us at the bottom of their desperate Google searches. <laughs> Time is up. Um, and they are referring their friends because that's how much they love the product. Next up, we are raising $2 million. So if this is interesting to you, come find me after, and I'm happy to share more. I want to leave you with one key message. Perimenopause is not a niche condition. So it's time for us to stop treating it like one. Thank you. Thank you, Dora. Let's start with the Q&A. Do we start with Juliet again or?
Let's, I mean, let's, let's set it over. Let's All right. Play ping pong. Well, you go first, then. <laughs> uh, I can go first. I mean, first of all, thanks for the pitches. This was fantastic. And um, love to see more female founders on stage, especially with your background. I think that's, that's incredible. Me too. Um, um, how did you get to know each other as a founding team? Like, how did you get together? And how did you make sure that you will also work well together in the next three, five, 10, 20 years, hopefully? How did that work? How did you build that chemistry for yourselves? I have so much to say on that. Um, Yeah, I actually was building Mohana on my own for quite a long time, but I knew that I always wanted to have a co-founder because for me, it's about the people that you work with. And I had a couple of co-founders in the past that unfortunately didn't work out. So this, this time, I really wanted to make sure that we work together and that we can accomplish milestones together before we make the her, uh, my official co-founder. So that's exactly what we did. And I think the work ethic and the ambition clicked so well that it, it was really just a, a no-brainer to move on to this. Cool. cool. Important. I think uh, maybe after finding your co-founder, bringing this to market, in healthcare, you obviously have to deal with regulation, particularly for a product like yours that is facing, facing patients. Um, how you think about this also as the depth of the product grows over time? Yes, so right now, because we are a bootstrap company, we are keeping uh, Mohana as a wellness company. So that means the care plans are very much about interventions that people can do on their own safely. And it's very important because what I really care about is empowering people to be proactive about their health because the medical system already is under so much burden. So if we can k take some of that burden and, 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 and empower people to feel in, in, um, to have the tools for their health, then it's a win-win for everybody. So that's uh, right now. And then, of course, as we build out this technology, we will have the capabilities to create actual medical recommendations, at which point, of course, regulation becomes extremely important. So you can include a doctor Uh, in the, um, uh, a human in the loop that receives the recommendations for the yeah. care plan. Um, I hope. Awesome. Talk to us a bit about the data that you're collecting and what you might be able to do with that in the future. Yes, I love that question. So as we know, there is a huge uh, health inequity between the amount of research we have on men and women. And it, you know, as someone who actually has worked in AI like my whole career, I'm really excited by the fact that we have actual blood test results from women combined with symptoms, and we actually make them do interventions so that we can study what is the effect of these interventions on their blood tests. And this is something that even if you look at academia, unfortunately, we don't have enough patients that, that enroll into, you know, s studies, so we don't have, um, What am I trying to say? Let me, let me restart that. Uh, basically, I think tech startups are really exciting because we can make these studies at scale. Yep, great. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that, uh, that you're collecting data from smart devices, wearables, and given your focus on interventions that people can use themselves initially, um, it seems like those device manufacturers are well positioned to be able to move into this market if they chose to. Um, and also given the size of the market, half of the population, are you, are you worried that they're better positioned with larger distribution to be able to go after the same market? Not at all, actually. It's not their focus, right? Like, let, let's just consider Aura House. I think yeah. they are probably <laughs> here in the audience. Yeah, they, they, um, they are primarily selling uh, the device and subscriptions to their platform, and they actually have an API very much for the purpose of integrating with other health companies like us who can provide additional uh, value on top of their uh, data. That's great. Thank you. Excellent. Awesome. Thank All you. Right. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Dora. Thank you. Thanks for the great question. Let's give a big round. As our third finalist, we will welcome Nima Salami from Oasis Now. Oasis Now is Europe's first AI-powered patient recruitment platform for clinical trials. They unlock electronic health records at clinical trial sites using their award-winning data privacy and security technology, ensuring compliance with Europe's strictest data protection laws. 
This enables a novel real-world data-driven approach to patient recruitment, reducing the patient identification process from months to minutes. Please welcome Nima on stage. My name is Dima, I'm CEO and co-founder of Oasis Now, and we are a clinical trial recruitment and real-world evidence platform. What makes us stand apart is in our unique approach in actually utilizing all patient data to identify what patients are eligible for which clinical trials. And this is thanks to our unique approach of building everything patient first, privacy by design, and AI enabled. But why are we doing this? Well, it starts with a personal story. My mom is a chronic and rare disease patient. And for years, she didn't have access to any medicine because no doctor had enough time to be constantly on the search of new medicine or clinical trials for her. So to me, as a cybersecurity nerd, as a computer science nerd, this seemed like a technical problem needing for a technical solution because all this data and knowledge about new treatments is somewhere. So I set out to build a solution for my mom. And along the way, I was joined with my amazing co-founder, Sarah Oghauser, who had this same data problem, but from the point of view of researchers who are working on the latest breakthroughs in medicine. And as a researcher working at one of the most renowned medical centers worldwide, she didn't have access to patient data to actually conduct her Alzheimer and aging research. So frustrated by this technical problem, both of us set out to spend the rest of our lives tackling it, starting at the largest bottleneck of healthcare and life sciences, and that is clinical trials. Because 85% of clinical trials are canceled or delayed because of this specific recruitment problem. And this is costing pharmaceutical companies upwards of 8 million of euros for every single day of delay. And for trial sites, the hospitals that actually run this trial, this is an operational nightmare. Two thirds of them actually fail to find the patients in time. It's taking them average of 13 months to find patients from their own databases. So from the database, they can't find their own patients. Why is that? Well, it's at the core of the problem is at where the data is, how it's stored. 80% of clinical data is unstructured, meaning that to this date, no algorithm have been actually able to utilize all this data to be able to query it. Well, as you and I know, we are in a different age. Large language models are here to the rescue because for the first time ever, we can actually utilize all this data. So that's what we do at Oasis now. We combine all medical knowledge and clinical guidelines with all the trial protocols for clinical trials and with all the patient electronic health records. And we can make an automated eligibility screening to see which patients and which medicine actually match. And surprisingly, more than 90% of European population already has electronic health records. So it's the healthcare organizations that are desperate for the latest technology. But as you can imagine, this is the most sensitive data that we have. So you can't just simply build an open AI wrapper and call it a day. You need to build solutions that are privacy first. Lucky for us, we are a cybersecurity firm. So we are actually the only party capable of combining all privacy technology and AI. I don't want to bore you with all the details of the technical part, that's what I'm excited about. But what I want you to remember is that this sophisticated privacy te by design technology unlocks this real world data by overcoming all regulatory roadblocks. We already know about the patient data and the AI, but what actually unlocks it is our proprietary award winning technology that can de identify the data on premise. And this has been validated by 
largest companies and uh, regulatory organizations in Europe and has already been compliant to the regulations. To be able to understand what OS now is going to do, I think it's good to look back at what we have already done. In the last month alone, we have already um, been operational at three trial sites and have matched hundreds of patients to these trials in matters of minutes. To scale our product, uh, we have signed an electronic health record provider that gives us access to 12 million patients' data. And our award-winning technology has unlocked this most sensitive data, our DNA, of thousands of patients. This is validated by NVIDIA and Google. And this is the all-star team that is capable of tackling such multidisciplinary problem. We have, from AI and cybersecurity uh, engineers with background in, of working at Amazon and Google, to 30 years of experience in pharmaceutical companies um, and clinical trials. And we just started our seed race, so if um, our mission resonates with you, um, I invite you to join, um, join us and let's together make personalized health accessible for everyone globally. Thank you, Nima. Well, thank you so much for this, uh, for your pitch. Um, CROs and EHR providers, et cetera, these are all notoriously difficult organizations to work with. I'm sure many startups here understand that. How have you been able to build trust with them? Um, I think that's thanks to years of, of building a reputation of building everything privacy by design. We have been advocating for the usage of latest privacy enhancing technologies in this field of healthcare for years, and this is what they've been researching. And thanks to um, our technology, we've been able to already comply to all the existing regulations in the whole of Europe, which has the strictest data privacy regulations, and already comply to the upcoming ones. And thanks to that, we've been able to unlock data sets at healthcare organizations, which post previously have been impossible. And we are going to continue building our reputation and make sure that patients are always prioritized. Thank you. Hey, what, what you're building is, is fantastic and really important. It's a, you know, it's a really important problem to solve. But who, who, who is your customer? Who are you selling to? Is it healthcare providers? Um, is it clinical trial uh, companies? Is it pharma companies? Is it all of the above? You need them all, you know, you said at the, at the juncture of all of those, but who are you, who's your customer? That's correct. Um, our customers go in phases. We first start with healthcare organizations. They are the data holders, and that's where we unlock the data. Um, but Expanding from healthcare organizations, contract business organizations would like to work with a group of them. So when we already have multiple of these sites, we can be the party that can provide them insights over a whole region or a certain disease group. And as we grow from there, then we can be the party that can be the neutral party between the patients directly and the pharmaceutical companies, basically speeding up the whole process. Thanks. This is as you said, a very complicated market to be in, huh? in terms of yeah. customers being complicated, regulation being complicated. How do you think about scaling this? Like, what's, what's going to be your focus at the beginning? Who are you targeting at the first place? Which countries are interesting to you, which may not be interesting? How do you think about strategic focus in, in your execution? That's a very good question. Um, we believe European market is ripe for disruption with new technologies. And um, we have been trying to sell our product to the healthcare for 40 years, and it's been ex extremely difficult. What we see that has changed recently is this um, thirst and eagerness for adopting AI-based technologies. And I would like to thank OpenAI for that, for somehow <laughs> making AI something very tangible for most people worldwide. So we talk to, from research nurses to principal investigators to um, decision makers that have tasted AI, and they want to have that in their day-to-day -day life. So somehow, the sales process have been going much faster recently. But to be able to actually scale this, um, we do this in two approach. One, we do it decentralized via the patients who have chronic or rare diseases that are active and are looking for new treatments for themselves. That's where they can sign up on our patient platform. But also, we want to bring that same technology to the healthcare organizations and CROs that can spread this between the hospitals that they already have contract with. Yeah. Let's say you win and uh, one million hits the account. What are you doing next? Who are you hiring? What are you going to do with the company? Um, we have amazing talent in the pipeline. Uh, great advisory people who have been supporting us along the way that we have been able to afford to have them full time. Uh, they have showed times and time that they want to come and work together with us and build the future of health information infrastructure. So, yeah. Any specific teams? 
Yes, so we have uh, people both on the technical aspect, so the, the best AI and cybersecurity engineers, but also on the, the sales and clinical aspect as well, so from doctors to people who have experience in working and selling to pharma and CRO. Excellent. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you for your time. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you to our finalists for those fantastic pitches and to our jury who will now head backstage to decide the winner. We are now moving into the final phase of Slush 100. While we're waiting for Philip and Juliet to make the final decision, our founder judges, Cal and Jochen, will stay here with us for a short Q&A, if you come here in front of me. All right, I have a few questions for you both. First off, as founders yourselves, what advice would you give to founders walking to their first VC meeting? <laughs> I think you know the, 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 three, the three founders that we just saw had, uh, had excellent pitches, tight pitches that they have you know, really developed over the, the course of the competition, pitching again and again, and it's to, uh, Get that practice in. Practice that pitch. You're going to hear the same questions from everybody. Get, have really good answers to them. Um, have really strong answers and a strong point of view. You, you can always hear unique new questions, but I think they, you know, we asked all three of those founders a lot of the same questions. Mm -hmm. What are you doing next? What is this money for? What's your next step? Where is the team coming from? What are the team's exp uh, you know, expertise and why is it relevant? And I think it's really important to practice that. Yeah. Um, no, it makes sense. Uh, by the way, I tried to look as an investor today. Couldn't find my Patagonia vest, but still. Um, Looking good. I, I believe, like one thing that I've learned along the way, and I've, we've done lots of fundraising over the, over the years, I think you need to also be sure that the chemistry on the other side works for you. So if, if someone doesn't fall in love in the first meeting, to some extent, there's no certain chemistry in that sense, and the other side is also excited about what you're doing, then stop spending too much time on it. It's very hard to convince someone who's super critical about what you're doing. Um, and I think fundraising is also a process around how do you spend your time efficiently? Where, where do you spend most time on to educate someone to ultimately get someone over the line and to fund your business? And we figured if people don't get excited early on, you're not going to get them excited along the way and you just can stop spending time, really. A hundred percent. Thank you. All right. Then, when it comes to securing early stage funding, what do you think is the most important quality or focus area for founders? <laughs> I think having a clear passion for what you're working on. Yeah. Um, I think the, you know, so much of it is you know, uh, down to luck and timing um, you know, and chance encounters and just getting that piece of technology right. Um, that you, the, that's so hard to measure, right? But what you can measure is how much somebody is in love with what they're, what they're trying to do. Because however, however things work out, it's going to be tough. And there are going to be draw, you know, setbacks. You're going to have to change direction. There are going to be challenges and a lot of tough days. And you have to love what you're doing and have a passion around it and really feel like it's a problem that you want to solve. And as, as one of the founders said, a problem that I want to spend the rest of my career on. Um, and that's a much easier founder to bet on. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. T totally. Um, I think what investors are looking for is really someone who's passionate about it, but where they also trust in this person is determined to make it work, whatever comes in their way. And there will be lots of stuff coming in your way, for sure. And this is, I think I would also advise people to talk to lots of people in the first place, like practice your pitch, pitch your idea, discuss with lots of people, and search for all the critical questions. Like, don't listen to the naysayers all that much, but like, listen to their critical questions around what could you possibly be asked and, and how do I think two, three steps ahead in terms of what kind of questions do I get, how do I prepare mentally for those questions? Because I think also that's what investors are looking for. Did this person really think through what this business is going to be and can be and like, what kind of obstacles can come into your way? And the more you've thought about it in the early days, the easier and more relaxed you're also in those pitch situations. Thank you. Then, before I let you go, one final question and a short answer. <laughs> Any comments on our amazing finalists, finalist trio that just pitched a while ago? What do you think about them? I mean, if they made it here, I think it's already an incredible achievement to be on the stage with the top three, and I think they should all be proud of themselves. Um, yes. Totally. 
Anything uh, for Ed? I, I would invest in all of them. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm not a successful investor, so uh, you know, don't necessarily follow my advice. But they were all compelling pitches. Yeah. I think they could be great businesses that all have a lot of challenges, but they're all exciting businesses. And whoever wins, I think uh, you know, they're all fantastic and should feel extremely proud yeah. of getting this far. Couldn't agree with you more. Thank you, Kellen Jochen, for sharing those insights and for lending your invaluable founder oh, of perspectives to of Slush 100. It's an honor, honor to have you here today oh. and uh, as part of the journey oh, for these so founders. Much. Let's give them a big round. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. And All I hope right. you enjoyed it as much as we did. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers. Bye-bye.